I came to Redfall to sell some books, meet some fans. Then, I'm running from vampires. I should be ecstatic. But these cryptids are out here trying to hurt and kill people. Can't let that stand. Especially since it seems none of us is getting out of Redfall anytime soon. Not when they can hide the sun and roll up the ocean like an old rug. Vampires aren't the worst of it. There's something even more evil underneath. What I've learned about Peter Addison makes me realize that monsters can't always be seen. He turned himself into this horror called the Hollow Man and kicked off a vampire apocalypse. Now I'm off to his home lab to see if there's a way to stop these bloodsuckers from running rampant. Addison's apotheosis into the Hollow Man happened in his home laboratory. If there's anything about how to stop him, it would be in there. Uh, hello, I'm Harvey Smith, uh, studio director at Arcane Austin and co-creative director of Redfall. Hey guys, Gabriel from Serial Killers. We had a Redfall preview event. Uh, we had a hands-on about one hour and a half with the game already. And yeah, let's go with the questions. So, uh, could you give us a bit uh, of a background um, of the game, of the project, how it started all out? Yeah, so uh, for people who don't know me, I've been making games for 28 years. I was lead designer of the original Deus Ex. Um, I worked on the early Deus Ex series. I was co-creative director of Dishonored 1, along with Rafael Colantonio, the founder of Arcane. Um, I then worked, I moved to Lyon, Arcane Lyon, and I worked on Dishonored 2, uh, while Raphael and Ricardo and the team in Austin, Arcane Austin, made Prey. I didn't work on Prey. I love it, but I didn't work on it. I wish I worked on it. Uh, and then I moved back, and um, Raphael left Arcane to go form um, uh, Wolf Eye, and they made the game Weird West. And so me and Ricardo uh, always wanted to make an open world game. Uh, we love Arcane's values. We both worked on the original Deus Ex. So these games that are a combination of first-person shooter and RPG in a narrative-rich environment with lots of environmental storytelling where you can go into an area and sort of see the history of the place, what happened here. There's a blood streak on the floor, up the wall. Maybe, oh, there's a scene on top of the roof. A guy and his body and his belongings and things like that. Maybe a note. Um, game mechanics that you can combine creatively. Um, you know, uh, multiple approaches to any place, uh, use of tools like hacking turrets so they're on your side, picking locks, things like that. We love this kind of game. Some people call them immersive sims. Um, and we've always thought it would play very nicely with open world, give you even more pathways and even more to explore. What we kind of didn't realize was how much extra work open world is to populate. Uh, if you imagine a scene from Dishonored with an L-shaped street you might start here there's some guards you go down the road you see some graffiti you you loot something off the roof over here you go further down the street you see granny rags throwing some things out the window you stop and talk to her that's maybe like 20 points of interest you know on a certain number of square meters but if you do the whole block around it and you have to have that same level of detail for the environmental storytelling and the en encounters it's a lot more work it's exponentially more work and so it's taken us a long time to complete Redfall. We're very excited about it now because it's come together. Um, and we started it before the pandemic it was going you know, Arcane's next big game. And then the pandemic happened. We sent everyone home. Uh, everybody's working from home mostly now. And it's, uh, it's really challenging to final a big, ambitious game uh, with everybody mostly working from their home. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's sort of what led us here was like... Uh, working on this new project, this new IP, um, an open world city where we take, a, we take a small town in New England, Redfall, Massachusetts. It's kind of spooky and haunted. And we make this spooky action game that is uh, an attempt to make an immersive sim in an open world. Um, balancing the whole thing out was probably a big, of a, uh, a big challenge for you. Um, could you go into detail how you managed to uh, make it happen in single player and co-op? Yeah, so that's a great question actually because it is gets right to the heart of things. It is a very tricky challenge to balance all of those things. Uh, and what I would say is balance is 
sometimes by design, like you set out and you say each hero will have a skill tree uh, with a bunch of passive skills and each hero will have three active skills, two that recharge and one that requires you to collect psychic residue through the world before you can use it. And that alone means, okay, well, there's not one character with 10 active skills. There's, everybody has three. So there's, there's some balance built into just consistent design. But then a lot of balance is intuitive. Uh, how do you balance Layla's lift power, where she creates a, an elevator that will take her up, you know, 30 uh, meters in the air or whatever, and you can upgrade it and do different things with it. How do you balance that versus uh, Jacob's summons a ghostly sniper rifle and can like automatically take out a number of people at once like that it's apples to oranges you know what i mean it's it's not an exact comparison so part of it is just play testing and play testing and play testing um and making tweaks here and there you know adding new ideas or tweaking a number but there is another big part of your question which is i feel like there's the spirit of your question is more like if you make an immersive sim or you make a uh, first-person exploration game, a shooter, some combination there, somewhere between Stalker and Far Cry and Dishonored, you know, somewhere in that territory. Mm -hmm. If you play one way, single player, you can go very slowly. You can sit on the roof and watch the sun set. The fog rolls in. You turn on your flashlight. You explore a haunted house. You pick a lock. You stop and listen. You sneak past a monster because your health is low or your ammo is low. Uh, these are the kinds of games that those of us who love you know the bioshocks of the world or the thief or the system show we love those games right and that is what we set out to make in an open world and we were we we stayed very true to that all through the development we defended that we don't have a bunch of powers that only really work in co-op or whatever everything has to work in single player mm -hmm. and so the question is how can you make a game that does that but also plays co-op and i i think the answer is if you're playing alone it feels right if you add one more person, it probably still feels right. If the two of you are playing together, like let's say you and your friend or you and your partner are playing and you're both kind of going at the, the, the right pace and hold on, hold on, I want to check something here. You know, I'm reading this note. Don't leave yet. Don't fire a shot. And it still feels like, you know, alone or with one other person, it still feels like the kind of thing I'm describing. If you add the third person or the fourth person, it does not. It's not that game anymore. It's a different game. Uh, four people running around is crazy, and it's like a party. And so it ceases to be anything close to an immersive sim at that point. It's a co-op shooter at that point. Um, now, you can still s cloak as Jacob, get close, sneak up, hack the turret so it's on your side. Uh, Layla gets on the roof. She puts a lift on the roof. Other people now get on the roof, too. Uh, but it's less about listening to overheard conversations and studying the environmental storytelling and deeper understanding of the story and uh, going at your own pace. It really is only that when you play single player or maybe with one person, the right person. Uh, and it just becomes a completely different experience. That said, that other experience is a lot of fun. Uh, I will tell you in my dreams, what I would love is if everybody played the game solo once and then they play with friends after that. Uh, to me, the multiplayer experience is incredibly fun. And uh, we saw earlier somebody uh, is playing Remy. So she has the C4 block. Mm -hmm. She puts it down and she jumps on it and and blows it at the same time she has boom jump it's an upgrade and so as it explodes she goes flying in the air and she shoots somebody on a bridge and as she's falling Layla puts down an elevator a lift and Remy lands on the lift and bounces again and goes even higher and shoots a guy on a higher bridge you know so um, we literally didn't know that that was possible we we never thought about that right a player just put that combination together um, and so a lot of the sort of emergent combinations are still there, but many of them are now scattered out across p different heroes. And so there's a player that was playing with Remy uh, the other day, and she has the little bot, Brebon, and he has a power to call aggro. If she activates it, Brebon starts waving his antenna. He has a, the kind of antenna that does the LED uh, light show, and he sounds an alarm, and all the aggro, all the enemies come after him at that point. But she also has the C4, and so she attached the C4 to him. She activates the aggro. When everybody closes in, she backs away, and she blows the C4. So she destroys the bot, but destroys a group of vampires as well. And then she goes and repairs the bot, you know. Uh, and so this is the kind of, like, fun game mechanics we like. But a lot of those are now also scattered across. If you play Jacob and I play Layla, you know, we can do things together. Getting the sniper to the roof is a good idea. 
Uh, so you use your lift and I get on the roof. Um, yeah, so it, the answer, I think, to the question is it's a big balancing act. It's a lot of intuitive play. It's a lot of institutional knowledge just from having done it over and over. And it's a, it's a lot of trying things. Just like, hey, mm -hmm. uh, r early on, a couple of months ago, we had a build where everybody was just using pistols. And one of the benefits of having the game online is that... Uh, you know, there's no MTX in our game. There's no store, right? It's all, if you find it in the game, you find it. Um, but we are online, right? So we can tell you if everybody's dying from falls or ladders, we can say, let's change the fall damage. Take less damage when you fall. We can, we can tune those things. So a couple of months ago, we saw that everybody was just using pistols. Why are they just using pistols? And it's because the range of the pistol was good enough that you could make headshots with pistols. So, of course, we... we Oh, we should have done this to begin with, but we add a distance fall off. So the damage, after a certain amount of distance, the damage falls off. Mm -hmm. So the pistol has a job in the game. The assault rifle has a job. The sniper rifle has a job. They all have separate roles. And then, of course, we, we have the standard weapons, but we also have vampire class weapons. You probably played with the UV beam or the stake launcher or the flare gun. Those are all very useful against vampires. Um, but it's just a constant, like, looking at problems, tweaking, tweaking a number, adding a small feature um, and, and adjusting and adjusting. Um, but the single player will always feel different than the four player co-op for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when it comes to vampires, uh, we added to uh, draw inspirations from uh, comics, books, uh, movies. Yeah. So, um, you know, in the modern world, there's a lot of vampires that are sort of aspirational. Like I wish I was beautiful and young forever and I could stay up all night and uh, party with my friends and it's like man this loses what it is to be a vampire i mean the vampires are people who drink your life to live longer and that's horrifying right <laughs> and so we drew back from nosferatu 30 days of night we drew back from these kind of sources dracula you know and um salem's lot there's a lot of in the 80s there was a film near dark you know the john carpenter's vampires there's a lot of fiction that depicts the vampires as like leeches you know mm -hmm. and monsters are always metaphors and we live in a modern world where a tiny percentage of people 0.1 percent of people are literally draining the life out of the rest of us right rivers are drying up um there are places with lead in the water where you can't drink the water you know and it Uh, there are companies that raise the price of, of medicines by 1,000%. Um, you know, so it seems like an interesting metaphor to take a, a medical-based startup, Avum, that is experimenting with taking the blood of younger people and making their wealthy clients live longer. Uh, but they accidentally unlock science-based psychic vampires. Uh, this seems like a very good, having just lived through the Trump years, Uh, it feels like a very good way to like express yourself as a creative, you know. Mm. Um, going in deep into the story, uh, can you tell us a bit uh, about the scale of the, the single player campaign? Like, how many hours can we expect? Or? Our games are always difficult like that. Like, when Dishonored One was coming out, I told people, you know, uh, I think the average person will play for 12 hours. Um, but we had people finish the game for the first time in eight hours mm. and we had people play the game for 40 hours. It just depends on how completionist you were and how much you stopped and listened to the overheard conversations and things like that. Uh, this game is much bigger than that. It has two open world districts. Both of them are about a kilometer and a half by a kilometer and a half, but it's made for the on foot scale. And so that means two things. That means you no know, vehicles, you walk, or you use fast travel. And so the distance feels right for that. There's no horse or whatever. Um, and it also means the level of density that we put in open world games, I think, is different than most. Like, you've played the game now, so you see. But, like, you go into a house, and you can see on the table what the family was having for dinner. Or uh, you go into someone's office, and there's books on the shelf and things like that. Um, there's lore or... Um, items of value scattered out through all the world uh, just like we do in Dishonored or Prey and that density is literally across the interiors and the exteriors of the open world and so if you play through the campaign missions you there are some missions you can do in different order there's some you can skip entirely uh, on top of the campaign there's also side missions there's a whole series of side missions mm -hmm. some of which you talk to characters to get and some of which you just find and you start the mission 
We also have safe houses where you can find them, power up, do some gameplay to power up the generator, clear the generator. You probably saw at least one of those, yeah. I would assume. Yeah, each one has a different gameplay. You power up the generator, the UV lights turn on. Now you can get down in the safe house, you get some resources, some characters move into there, and you can uh, fast travel to there. There's also nests where you find a ghostly door and you go inside and you can clear the nest. And anywhere you haven't cleared a nest, there's a large glowing bubble that spreads and the monsters are much harder inside the bubble. Um, and then on top of that, there are other things to find in the world, grave locks and um, one, one thing we call one shots, which are very tight, single location, uh, arcane style puzzle to get to something valuable. Um, and there's three flavors of those. There's you know, vampire one shots, there's cultist one shots and bellwether. Bellwether is the private military contractors on the island. And even the safe house missions, when you go into a safe house to clear that, there's this whole neighborhood capture system that I was talking about. To clear each neighborhood, you go in, find the safe house, get it powered up. You uh, do a safe house mission, which can be like entrapment or the blood tree or triangulation or bellwether supply drop. There's all these different safe house missions. And once you've done that, you kill the vampire underboss. And that is like a handcrafted mission. You go to a specific location, fog rolls in, the vampire has uh, elite traits, you know, uh, and then you've secured the neighborhood uh, and you get the vampire underboss's skull, which you can use later uh, to unlock a door. But yeah, there's just like, it's hard to say how many hours when people play the first time. Uh, we have people that spend a speed run and they do 25 hours. And then we have people that take their time and they do 50 hours, you know, so, um, and then we have other stuff coming too, you know, so. Mm -hmm. uh, Uh, so final question, uh, if you could pick one feature of the game or one uh, part that really makes the game uh, stand out, uh, what would it be? Oh, that's interesting. There's so many things. Uh, we've always wanted to do dynamic sun where the sun rises and sets and the monsters are a little different by day and by night. You know, the, the spawns are a little different. Uh, I really like the, the hazards. It's, it's built on an elemental damage system where light, you know, pools of petrol and fire and electricity matter. UV light matters. Uh, there's a thing called death mist that you can clear that is uh, a red mist on the ground that matters. Uh, so I really just like that gameplay ecology, I think, uh, all of those things together. Every time you go down a street, there's a uh, variable configuration. Sometimes it's empty, sometimes some cultists have erected a scaffolding and they're talking through bullhorns. Sometimes it's uh, some bellwether guys with their UV lights and a petrified vampire. We have all these vignettes that cycle in and out, you know. Um, and so it's just the variability of the world and the, the dynamic nature. That's why we wanted to make an open world game. And so for, for me, I just worked on eight straight years of Dishonored. Dishonored 1, Knife of Dunwall, Brigmore Witches, Dishonored 2, Death of the Outsider. That's eight years. And so I just really felt excited about Redfall, doing what we do creatively in an open world has been really invigorating, you know. So uh, I think that's probably the parts that I'm most excited about. That everything tied to the open world, you know. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks for your time. It was great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>